Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm here for the good afternoons back. Um, so uh, my name is Devin Fitzgerald, and I'm the curator of rare books in the history of printing at UCLA Library Special Collections. Uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone to Feminist Biblio Bibliographies, sponsored by UCLA Library Special Collections and uh, UCLA Library. Before we start today, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. This is something we do routinely here at UCLA, and it speaks to our core values of uh, elevating and raising up voices that have been left out of our historical records. Uh, UCLA is located on the ancestral lands of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. Um, so the first thing I want to do uh, before we get, get the panel going is introduce our Director of Library Special Collections, Athena Jackson, uh, who has a few minutes of welcoming remarks. And then after that, you'll hear from me again, and I'll describe some of the motivations behind this panel. So without further ado, here's Athena Jackson. Hello, everybody on, on the floor and online. Uh, my name is Athena Jackson. I'm very happy to welcome you here today. It's a very important event that addresses our core issues of special collections librarianship and those of our colleagues across the disciplines, bibliography. In this welcome, I would be remiss not to draw from the work of April Hathcock, Myung Yu, Wu, Sharon Farb, Charlotte Rowe, Jimena Del Rio Riande, Ivan Lujano, and Sandra Inima, who, while at the 2019 Triangle Scholarly Communications Institute held in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, developed the Feminist Framework for Radical Knowledge Collaboration. As noted in Hathcock's At the Intersection, a blog about the intersection of laws, librarian, libraries, feminism, and diversity, the work toward this framework started with three questions. How has the patriarchy affected you? How has the patriarchy impacted your work? How have you been complicit in perpetuating the patriarchy? I encourage you to explore their overarching principles if you haven't already, as so much of what they say may be echoed or alluded to in these talks with respect to trust, reclaiming space and time, and critical reflection, to name a few. As someone who began her work in this field through rare book librarianship, I recall in my early days a sense of otherness not only as a woman of color from a low socioeconomic background, which is something I grapple with often in terms of perception, but really it also has a lot to do with the stringency of rules and historical practices and even knowledge hoarders that seem to withhold from me the very tools and experiences I needed to succeed. I found a way, and I even used this experience to underscore a point in an article I wrote on succession planning in our field back in 2015. I stated, our past is still relevant to the work we currently do, but it need not be presented as a long lost, possibly never to be recreated ex expertise rather than a useful activity worthy of mastering, giving today, get mastering today given the proper exposure and training. I wrote that in the middle of the last decade. A lot has changed since 2015, but I think if I were asked to rethink this sentiment via those questions posed by the Feminist Framework for Radical Knowledge Collaboration, I would own a few things right now. I was complicit in perpetuating the patriarchy back in 2015, even while working directly against it in many other ways in my work up to that point. It's the worst kind of complicity, the invisible, even to the self kind of complicity. At the time of writing, it affected me by my thinking that other lenses, even my own, still needed to be secondary or, or was even less than what was already in place, seemingly etched in our professional stone. I was so quick not to question the training, training I received. I was certainly not encouraged, but that was then and this is now. Since then, I've grown. I've learned a lot about myself, my work, my field, and my place in it. I'm indebted to the colleagues who went through that journey with me and those who arrived in our field later ready to take us further. I'm an elbow grease and relentless woman. I take risks, I fail, and I make mistakes. 
I don't know everything. And all of those things are frankly good because you know what? There's a lot I do know, a lot that I can attempt and succeed in, and a lot of agency I have now to create space and time for others. I now know that there, there are these things, lenses, not one lens, perspectives, not one or two perspectives, challenges, and not just the ones that make you and me comfortable, and new insights, especially the ones that afford me the space to learn. These are what I imagine are thoughts I may share with our speakers today. So without further ado, I will join you in the audience to do that just now. Learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Athena. Um, and thank you for the very provocative opening. Obviously, this is something that someone who looks like me should be grappling with on a daily basis. Uh, unfortunately, it's not something that's talked about explicitly. In fact, I was going back and forth whether or not to center the, my identity here. And it's something I grapple with a lot. You know, I'm an East Asianist. I work on the history of non-Western traditions. I talk about diversity in book histories a lot. Um, but my activism actually has its roots in a rather interesting place, which is in classrooms at Smith College. Um, because I went to college at U the University of Massachusetts Amherst and made the great decision of taking most of my elective courses at Smith College. And that immediately charged me with this sense of how important feminist perspectives are uh, for asking a myriad of questions. Now, when I was first thinking about this talk today, I was maybe going to give some examples of the important role of women in book history. I could have told you that our oldest printed object in UCLA Special Collections is a small Buddhist uh, chant that was commissioned by the Empress Shotoku in 8th century Japan. I could have also talked about the fact that the first person to sell a book in Japanese book history was a woman, a female bookseller. Then I also was thinking about talking about this great collection of Chinese female poets that was published in the 17th century that collected the writings of over 1,500 women. But as I was reflecting, this quote kept coming to mind. It's a quote by Dorothy Porter, a bibliographer and the librarian and curator at the Moreland Spingarn Research Center at How Howard University. Uh, she passed away in 2004, I believe. And she noted that, the only rewarding thing for me is to bring light to information that no one knows. What's the point of rehashing the same old thing? So I'm not going to tell you about these things I already know. We can talk about that afterwards. Uh, instead, I want to start by thinking about these two terms that we're provoking uh, discussion around, which is feminism and bibliography. Listeners unfamiliar with these terms, or more likely the combination of these terms, right? This is something that one of our panelists, Sarah Werner, was, was a pioneer in popularizing this term, but it's still new. And we all have space here to find out what this means to us. So when I was thinking about feminism, I thought specifically about Patricia Hill Collins and her work, Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Politics of Emp Empowerment, and her idea of the matrix of domination. Uh, this is a really fantastic idea especially for me, uh, you know, working class, first generation, but also a Harvard PhD candidate who's a white male, to think about the different ways our intersectionalities contribute to forms of oppression and hegemony. Uh, in fact, Collins defines this matrix of domination as something uh, that is structural, disciplinary, hegemonic, and interpersonal. Uh, and these domains of power reappear across quite different forms of oppression. And that's something I learned from feminist theory, was how to interrogate these different intersectionalities and the fact that power is always active. Power is part of every form of negotiation, every form of a relationship. Uh, and in libraries, this seems especially apparent because lots of us work in buildings with the names of men carved on the outside, while the labor done internally in libraries is are these carts of books pushed around by less privileged hands. Now, paying attention to hegemonies, as feminist theory taught me to do, uh, and thinking through how uh, these hegemonies intersect with gender, race, and class helps all of us think about our own experiences, and also allows those of us engaged with histories of the book 
to consider how classification and description, and in fact, the rare book trade and publication reinforce dif different power relationships. Now, critiques of classification abound, and this is where we get to the bibliography, which is the core of what so many of us do in the library profession, is to promote books by creating lists of books, sharing our knowledge of books with the world. This is always a matter of choice. And as I've learned in the last year, year or so at this job, that the curators who were telling me they weren't interested in getting non-Western African-American materials into those collections were actually saying that they personally weren't interested. This was a personal choice. Uh, now, one of my favorite librarians in history, again, we'll return to Dorothy Porter, who attacked in a fundamental, fundamentally bibliographic way the hegemony of classifications. Uh, while she was at Howard University, she focused specifically on the duodecimal, uh, de Dewey Decimal System. And this is what she noted in her oral history. They had one number, 326. That meant slavery. And they had one other number, 325, as I recall it. That meant colonization. In many white libraries, every book, whether it was a book of poems by James Weldon Johnson, who everyone knew was a black poet, went under 325. That's colonization. Uh, and that was stupid to me. I think we can all agree that that is, in fact, the appropriate adjective for this form of classification. It is pure stupidity, but it's stupidity with purpose. It's the stupidity of the hegemony. And today, our purpose, I hope, is to, uh, through three provocative talks with scholars who have all personally influenced me in one way or another, uh, to address the stupidity of the hegemony. Um, and, you know, thinking historically, it's really important to point out that Porter, Porter's career as an early black female librarian is really pivotal, pivotal in allowing us to have these conversations in the field. It's a testament to the impossibility of separating bibliographies from history of power, histories of power, and the importance of explicitly putting critical theories like feminist theory into dialogue with bibliography. Uh, now, that's all I have to say about these two terms. I, I think you're provoked. I, I see wheels spinning in the audience. Um, but before I go into the actual talks, I just want to make visible some of the invisible labor behind this conference. So I'd like to personally acknowledge Jet Courtney Jacobs, Head of Public Services, Outreach and Community Engagement, who this morning described uh, events I organized as perpetually cursed. Uh, <laughs> Last time I organized an event on Latinx bibliography, it was across the same exact day as Collecting Los Angeles Conference, uh, which also had a radical agenda. And so it was a quieter conference at the LAPL. And so Courtney, oh, j oh and the city was on fire. Uh, this time I have one up myself with global pandemic. Uh, <laughs> which has kept one of our conference uh, presenters on, online. So wait for next year, because I think my, the next thing I probably do will be around election time. Um, so invest in prepping. Um, the next person who was really important to this event was Molly Hemphill, the curatorial assistant, uh, who has done imp impossible amounts of work behind the scenes, and this morning has also bleached the entire unit of special collections uh, with a fervor. And I wouldn't let her get to my computer because I was writing my opening comments. And so she said she'll do it tomorrow. Um, so this is a lot of this labor behind the scenes. And of course, uh, Caroline Cubay, who's allowed us to have a digital component to this and that we're sharing with lots of people online. Uh, Susie Lee has also made this streaming possible by facilitating us being in the library conference room. And finally, of course, Athena Jackson, uh, who, well, you've heard her comments. I don't need to talk about how great she is. And Sharon Farb, uh, who for Christmas gave me pencils engraved with Fight the Patriarchy, Abolish Ice, uh, because Sharon Farb has my number. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Sarah Warner. Um, and... Of course, there are debts to her because in some ways, Sarah has been at the center of a lot of these recent conversations about feminism and bibliography and their relationship. 
Uh, Sarah Werner is a book historian and author of Studying Early Printed Books, 1450 to 1800, A Practical Guide. Uh, and she's joining us remotely. Um, and I think she's worked at the Folger Shakespeare Library. Actually, that Studying Early Printed Books was her second book. She's done a lot, and you're about to hear how wonderfully smart she is. Uh, so without further ado, please give a hand for Sarah to distract from me trying to set up the Zoom. All right. Hi, everyone. I think I unmuted myself. We're just setting this up. Hold on a second, Sarah. Okay. I, I think it's because I didn't end my slideshow. <gasps> hold on, hold on. We knew this was going to happen. Okay, now go full screen. Oh, wait, you see it now. I just have to. Last time we checked this, there was always a slight delay. So you're still seeing my notes, but it should be presenter view. Oh, there we go. Cool. And mm -hmm. I'm going to turn up your volume. Oops. All right, say a, word. Sue, say a word for us. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm so happy I can be there from far away. Does that work? <laughs> yeah. I'm loud enough? Okay. I have just lost my, it's right, it's, this is why I printed it out. I cannot figure out how to do the presenter view from me, but you guys see the slides, maybe I'm in the corner. I have paper, so it's this awesome combination of really old fashioned tech and really exciting new tech. Um, I just wanna start by saying, Thank you to Devin and to Jed and to Molly and to Susie and everyone else um, that Devin just listed for you for um, all the logistics in making this possible. Um, and a thank you to my fellow panelists. I'm super sad I'm not there to um, say hello in person, but I'm looking forward to the conversations that this session is gonna um, enable us to have. So, I want to use this time today to think about what crafting a feminist practice of bibliography looks like and to think about why we should want to attempt it. But first, I'm going to explain a little bit about the backstory because it helps set up my perspective and why I got anxious about this topic a few years ago. At the time, one second, the slide should change. Oh my God, why doesn't it change? Oh, there we go. Um, so I've spent the past few years writing a book about how the Western printing press worked. Um, I've focused specifically on machines and the processes from the hand press period, things like how paper was made, how type is set, how or whether books are bound, and on the uses and processes in today's period, things like how do we find books? How do we understand their uses by looking at their material features? It was a pretty consuming project. Um, and about halfway through writing the book, in part because the vast majority of students that I were teaching were women in my classes, I suddenly got worried that the I suddenly got worried about whether I had inadvertently left behind my origins as a feminist scholar and was inadvertently writing a book that reinscribed values that I had fought against. Uh, the first book that I wrote was about Shakespeare and feminist performance. And this was something that had really been central to my um, scholarly process. But I had this realization and I wasn't really sure how to correct it. How could I make this book I was writing a feminist project when it wasn't really about people involved in these processes? One option I thought was a deliberate citation strategy. Even though the book wasn't about people, it does use lots of examples of work. I'm sorry, I was distracted by something here. Um, lots of examples of work by people to explain what I'm looking at. Lots of past and modern publications. I tried to cite women very deliberately, both as authors and printers of the early printed books and as modern scholars of bibliography. I thought I had done a pretty good job, but when I was doing my index 
and I decided to count my citations, I found that I had failed miserably to achieve any sort of balance. I'd horrifyingly recreated that situation that we've all heard studies of in which women speak for a small percentage of time, but are perceived by men in the room as dominating the conversation. Citations obviously are a strategy if you pay close attention to actual numbers and not perception. But it's also hard to cite work that isn't there. And no matter how much I pay attention to what I'm doing, I cannot discuss printer's manuals and make women's voices prevalent when I'm focused on the hand press period. I believe strongly in the value of handling and understanding the materiality of the texts we work with. And I want that to also be a feminist practice. I'm not particularly interested in the book trade, to be honest, or in how authorship is crafted. I'm interested in the artifacts we hold in our hands and what they can tell us. And maybe because of my training as a Shakespearean who focused on feminist theater, I want my feminism to work for studying all texts, regardless of who has written or printed or created them. And most importantly, I want my practice to be replicable for others. So how do we craft a feminist practice of bibliography that can do these things? Tackling this question also means defining our terms. So what is bibliography? A term bibliography gets used in all sorts of ways. Um, I think we're gonna discover that all three of us in the panel think about it slightly differently, which is great. Um, one of the ways that we are probably most familiar with is when it's used to refer to a listing of sources for a paper, the formatting of which our students all groan about. It can also be a gathering of material related to a specific subject, what I would describe as enumerative bibliography. And a great example of this for our concerns today is the Women in Book History bibliography run by Kate Coker and my fellow pals, Kate Osment. Bibliography is also sometimes used to mean just the study of the history of books or print culture. For instance, the development of printing in the West or the connections between women writing, printing, and publishing in early modern England. But because I spent so many years working and teaching in a rare materials library, my type of bibliography is physical, that is studying material artifacts for signs of their making and their use. Fretz and Bowers, Philip Gaskell, Don McKenzie, their work is at the core of this discipline. For years, bibliographers have gotten a bad rap for being dull and obsessed with obscure facts and uninterested in explaining to anyone else what they were doing and why it mattered. And honestly, that reputation is not entirely undeserved. Many bibliographers wield their expertise as a weapon keeping those outside the field from crossing in. And I should acknowledge that Mackenzie is a real exception to this pattern. He's someone who argued for why bibliography mattered and who was able to do so in a compelling and accessible way. But he is the exception that proves the rule. This insistence on expertise is partly why it took until last year for an actually accessible introduction to studying this subject came out. One that tries and succeeds, I hope, in welcoming newcomers to the field and in giving them a sense of why it matters and how to enjoy it. So that tells you what my sort of bibliography is. And that brings us to the other noun of my title. What is feminism? This is even more possible answers than how to define bibliography, but it does give us a chance to wonder why we're invested in what a feminist bibliography might be. Like many of us, perhaps, I read a lot of feminist theory as an undergraduate and graduate student. At the time, back in the 80s and 90s, that meant Julia Kristeva, Helene Sixu, Toro Moy, Judith Butler, and Peggy Phelan and a lot of other very smart people writing very dense performative texts 
that were sometimes grounded in a pretty limited notion of what women's bodies were and were frequently focused on white women's experiences in the world. What thinking about feminism means for me now is a lot of rereading Sarah Ahmed, whose 2017 book, Living a Feminist Life, is compelling for how it blends life and theory to illuminate the structures we bump into and for its intersectional strategies for understanding and responding to them. Part of Ahmed's argument is that being a feminist means living in a world that constantly tells you what you are experiencing isn't there. A feminist movement thus requires that we acquire feminist tendencies, a willingness to keep going despite or even because of what we come up against. We could think of this process as practicing feminism. One of the lessons I take from Ahmed here is that this, from this is that a feminist practice is one that is willing to return to the beginning over and over. It's something that we are constantly relearning, one that therefore takes as its premise a willingness and an obligation to welcome in newcomers. In other words, what I take from Ahmed in thinking about this type of feminism is exactly the opposite of what I had been seeing and how bibliographers use expertise to block people out instead of welcoming people in. So, if bibliography, for our purposes, is the study of material texts as they are made and as they move through time, what is feminist bibliography? Is it the study of texts made by women? The study of texts made by feminists? Neither of those approaches would have helped me write my book, nor would that be a methodology necessarily different from regular old bibliography. I could quote Audre Lorde here on the master's tools, but I assume you all know that, even if we don't always remember to enact it. What I find more interesting so far in my experience of leading workshops and giving talks about feminist bibliography is that people find it incredibly difficult to separate text from object and to think about the object through a feminist lens rather than focusing on the text. Even bibliographers who are trained to focus on the artifact still want to think that a feminist praxis is only interested in text. So I thought what I would do today is with you look at a set of illustrative questions that we can use to ask um, in thinking about what a feminist bibliography might do. So instead of approaching our task only from the question of what books we study, Let's also ask, how do we study books? Where do they come from? Why do we study them? And who studies them? That seems like obvious questions maybe, but once you start really pulling them apart, there's a lot of things that we take for us granted when maybe we should be thinking more carefully. So how do we study books? Do we prop open the book on our desk and start reading immediately? Or in the case of the Australian soldier on the left, I guess, prop open a book and let it drape over the edge of the desk. I love the photo, but every time I look at it, I kind of get the, no, it's going to fall apart. Do we look at the four edges of our books? Do we wonder about the bindings or do we just open it up immediately and not look at what's happening before the text starts? Do we study how books are made and try that out ourselves, setting type and making paper? Where do books come from? For most of us, books come from libraries. If you're interested in provenance, books might come through chains of owners until they're acquired by the library you're using. But how does your library get them? What are the gendered circumstances shaping this interaction? Last fall, as some of you know, rare book librarians and dealers suddenly started talking openly about a long-standing fact of these transactions male-only book clubs. In September, a curator at Princeton announced a change in policy, blogging in a post titled Men Only, that beginning today, new acquisitions for the graphic arts collection will no longer be purchased from collectors or dealers who belong to the restricted bibliographic societies in America, 
such as the Club of Odd Volumes or the Relfund Club. This note will give those men time to resign their memberships should they wish to continue to provide items for graphic arts. Looking forward to great new acquisitions in the future. Best, Julie. This was in and of itself um, an incredible spark for conversation. Lots of people hadn't realized, both scholars and some librarians, that male-only bibliographic societies were still a thing. And it turns out that they are a very influential thing. A couple of weeks after Julie Melby's original blog post had gone up, folks started to notice that it had been anonymously edited. To now read an earlier blog post incorrectly described university policy for acquiring material. Princeton University Library supports and follows the university's policy on supplier diversity. Although I have heard that there were some dealers who took the notice to heart and quit their clubs, it seems clear from having watched the subsequent interactions that Melby and the library were overruled probably at the instigation of a powerful donor or alumni who belonged to one of those clubs. We should ask ourselves what we don't normally, how are those systems for circulating books, silencing voices, and shaping what we study today? We should also ask why do we study books? And this for me is where things start to get exciting. Why do we study books as artifacts instead of as texts? If the works you are reading are available in later editions or in digital copies, why are you sitting in a rare books library? Well, one reason is that we can learn more not only about how they were made and corrected, as with that cancel slip showing in the Chaucer volume on the left, but how they were used, as with this history of Scotland, here with an initial letter that had been cut out, and then later replaced with a pen and ink facsimile. And of course, so many categories of text don't get made into easily accessible editions or digital images. Books with moving parts, like the Vavelles and Cortez's Art of Navigation, aren't readily replicable in other formats. Almanacs tend not to get imaged, nor do vocabularies or genealogies or courtesy books. If we don't study books in person, we exclude large swaths of our printed history. And who studies books? Since, from, since feminist practice should be about expanding access, bringing in new people and new questions, we should also ask who studies rare books? Is it something professors do in isolation? Is it something that college students do in classrooms? Is it something that we welcome in all members of our communities to undertake? For me, in other words, a feminist practice of bibliography is one that is focused on bringing in everyone who has been excluded so that we can build a future as widely imaginative as possible. If bibliographers of the past have been focused on identifying printing processes so that we can know exactly who pirated Shakespeare's works, and a lot of Anglophone book history is built exactly on those origins, I want the bibliography of the future to look at artifacts and processes that we have not yet even created. I want to come back to something that I glancingly referred to at the start of my talk, that I focused on the need to create a feminist bibliography because my classes were overwhelmingly taken by women. Your classes, if you teach in the humanities, are probably similar. But the professions we occupy as librarians and as teachers have become, become increasingly male the further up the hierarchy we rise. Our students might be women, but our leaders are usually men. And that is not only not right, it's not sustainable. We cannot assume that doing things the same way we've been doing them is going to continue into the future. When I suggest that our field is facing problems today because it is white and male, what I want to focus on is how much knowledge and experience we are missing and how unsustainable this pattern is. 
Think about Dorothy Porter at Howard University and how she saw what the white librarians of her era did not, that the Dewey classification system collapses any possibility of blacks being seen through the lens um, of anything other than slavery or colonization. And what about Paula McDowell's revelations of women's participation in public print and debate in the 18th century? How could we even begin to think about book history as a discipline without Elizabeth Eisenstein? Our world would be immeasurably poorer without these women. The future of printing must be written by a much broader range of people if our field is going to not only be relevant and exciting, but if it is going to survive. Bibliographers are a small group of scholars heavily indebted to the past, a past when women could barely squeeze through the entrance into Fredson Bauer's classes. And it's a past of male scholars and female typists that still determines how we understand and describe books. So why do we need a feminist praxis of printing history? We need it so we can thrive. A feminist pedagogy that centers on asking questions instead of mastering knowledge welcomes in newcomers to the field. A feminist pedagogy that models the act of learning makes it possible for students to become teachers. And then our bibliographies and analyses can become the groundwork for exciting new histories. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop that share. Oh, and now we're in, now we're in the infinity tunnel. Um, oh God. Which is the end result of hearing Sarah talk usually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we'll leave the infinity tunnel up as we reflect. Um, so we have a, uh, about 10 minutes or so for Q and A. It's open to the floor. Um, maybe if someone pops something into the chat box, Jet is watching it. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for Sarah uh, and is not too distracted by the infinity, I can also move it. Um, please, uh, please raise your hand. Yeah, this is a question from Athena Jackson. Hi, Sarah, I think we've met before. Hi, Athena. <laughs> I have a question from your opening remarks. By the way, thank you. That was a brilliant talk, and it should be um, heralded across all of our streams um, henceforth. Thank you. Um, you mentioned it was hard to cite work that isn't there in one part of a paragraph. And near the end of that paragraph, I'm assuming you said that you hope that your work could um, essentially be replicable by others. And I feel like there's some moment here of of the beginning stages of creating tap you know the first level to be re replicated going forward and i wondered where you start where you're starting to see now um in some of the research happening where you're seeing repli replicability and your work happening with other uh, feminist bibliographers does that make sense i think it makes okay good sense um so one of the if if i had been able to be there in person, um, the talk was actually gonna move into a moment where I could sort of do a weird workshop with people in the room, um, even though it's not set up with that, is where we could look through a book together and think about what questions would we ask of this book and how can you bring these expertises back from back to your classroom. Um, and part of what got lost when I had to cut that out was coming up with a methodology that doesn't center expertise, um, because you, you, you can never be expert enough. I'm not expert enough by far on these things that I, um, that I write about. There's always stuff that we don't know, and we can't ever hope that our students or anybody new to the field can then suddenly become experts. That's not gonna happen. Um, but if instead of a methodology that depends on knowing all the answers, um, we create a methodology that foregrounds asking questions. That I think is something that becomes more replicable. Uh, and I actually see that happening um, not necessarily 
foregrounded in feminist terms, but um, just in teaching and access to rare books um, across special collections libraries, um, not only in the States, but in um, England and in Canada. Um, those are the library systems I'm most familiar with. Um, but a sort of inviting, a, a shifting sense from what it used to be of inviting people in um, to look at books and inviting in students and having them work with that. Um, and what I'm hoping we'll start to see more of is thinking about the dynamics that we create in those spaces through a feminist analysis. I'm not sure if that answers your, your, your question. What I didn't want to do was come up with a like, this is how you do feminist bibliography. You have to have mastered all of this stuff and you have to be able to do work that people have done that's great, but like here's all of the gendered analysis of these printers manuals and now we can go forward. And I thought, who, like, that's just yet another um, barrier of knowledge. Um, so I'm hoping that we can look at things from an angle of exploration and openness. I don't know if that. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, any other questions in the room? Questions? Um, I had a question. Uh, so generally speaking, lots of students will be open to this uh, because they haven't encountered rare books for the first time. Um, but how do you see this working with more conservative members of the, the profession uh, more generally, the people who like to guard their treasures? Uh, I mean, how, how can we retool this message to get everyone on board with a more activist, feminist approach uh, to rare book description? That, that Devin, is the big question. Um, I don't, I, it's hard I don't, it's hard to, I think, see how that's going to happen, except with really persistent work, well, for two thoughts, really persistent work from those of us doing this type of teaching. Um, as, as universities, oh God, the virus is throwing all of this off. What I was going to say is as universities have sought to distinguish themselves from other universities, one of the ways that they have started doing that is by turning to special collections libraries. Because by definition, what we have in those libraries, other universities and colleges do not, right? Um, as opposed to the library system holds, you know, 300 million volumes. You're like, well, yeah, everybody's does now because we're all in consortia. Um, faculty, faculty research. So I see libraries as, um, having already shifted to coming in, share our stuff. Um, faculty research, uh, if there are faculty members there, you can, you can tell me differently. I don't, I still see a lot of hoarding treasures happening with how, what we value in faculty research. Um, the ways it gets talked about as being discoveries, the ways that there are people who object to sharing information until it finally appears in print, which is a forever process. Um, and I think the way that that's gonna change is when people see the conversations that happen and that proceed by leaps and bounds forward while they're being muzzled because they wanna keep their treasures to themselves. So they're gonna be left out of conversations that other folks are having um, in bringing in and sharing openly what they're working with. It's a, it's a shift from how lots of folks have been trained um, and a shift to valuing the ability to ask questions as opposed to um, discourse at length on your expertise it's it's work we're gonna have to really push people to think differently about um how to teach and how to conduct research if that's what's going to happen great thanks so much sarah uh if there are no questions left um i'll like to invite everyone to give sarah another round of applause thank you um and momentarily Introduce our next speaker.
So our next speaker this afternoon is Kate Osment, uh, one of the founders of uh, Women in Book History Bibliography, which Sarah mentioned. Uh, and uh, Dr. Osment is assistant professor of English at Cal Poly Pomona. She specializes in early modern English literature, especially after the Restoration, uh, with an emphasis on gender studies, book history, and digital humanities. Uh, in addition to being the co-editor of Women in Book History Bibliography, uh, she's the general editor at the Stainforth Library of Women's Writing Project and runs a marvelous blog, and you should also follow her on Twitter. Um, so without further ado, please give your hand uh, a round of applause uh, to Dr. Oz. Um, similarly to Sarah, I'd like to start by saying thank you to everybody at UCLA for organizing the symposium and thank all of you for being brave enough to come out today, uh, despite the fact we're canceling everything. Um, but Sarah actually set this up perfectly for me and um, I'm incredibly grateful for that because one of the questions that she asked are where do books come from and she brought up the male only bibliophile societies. And that's exactly what I'm here to talk to you about today is a male only bibliophile societies, except more specifically uh, what women did anyway, despite the fact that they couldn't get into these. So I'd like to start by introducing you to Miriam Young Holden. Um, this picture is fabulous. My life, if I could have a library and a dog, would be perfect forever. Uh, but this is Miriam Young Holden. She was a book collector and bibliographer in the mid 20th century United States who amassed a collection of more than 6,000 books on the history of women. While she was committed to women's issues in the United States, her interests were wide ranging and extended to Greece, China, and the Byzantine Empire. Like many collectors, Holden's library was personally motivated. She used it to ameliorate a lack of institutional interest in women's history, and she collected books that were not necessarily beautiful, but useful. She articulated this philosophy in 1960 in an address to Roswitha Club at her New York City brownstone. She said, please remember when you see my books that I do not have them because they are rare or because of their value. I collect them only because I hope that they contain within them some significant record of women that will be meaningful to those who are seeking and using them. Most of this collection is currently housed on the first floor of Princeton's Firestone Library in open shelving, similarly to how it was set up in Holden's home. Unable to find what they were looking for elsewhere, researchers like Gerda Lerner came to Holden's meticulously organized space where she allowed them access to her private collection. Lerner wrote, in this library, the history of women was a reality. The possibilities of comparative and interdisciplinary approaches were evident. To be in that library was to be in the presence of a pioneer, a woman who formed a link between the lost women accessible only through the printed page and the ongoing struggle of women for their rights, for equality and opportunity, for autonomy and decision making. Lerner positions Holden as exceptional and in many ways she was. Her drive for collecting books and writing about women's history was not a profession, but a life within, uh, but a project within a life of political advocacy. She was involved in community organizations like Planned Parenthood, the NAACP, and the Urban League. The fact that Holden had the financial ability to collect, house, and care for thousands of books is notable, as it is that a prestigious library like Princeton was interested in taking the collection and maintaining it. In other ways, though, Holden was incredibly typical for a woman in the United States in this period. Her formal education was sparse. She took a few courses in social work at Simmons College before leaving after one year in 1914, and this was before most universities were open to women. And speaking broadly, women's post-secondary education was limited to programs focused on professions like librarianship, nursing, education, or secretarial work, and with, of course, the rarer option of attending one of the women's colleges or co-educational universities. Most of Holden's education was self-guided then, drawing directly from these books. While she became very well versed on her topic, this experience proved to her that it was essential to codify women's history in higher education. Alongside Eugenia Leonard, uh, Eugenia Leonard and Mary Ritter Beard, she positioned universities for decades to teach a course on women's history. Lerner reports that they wrote proposals, curricula, bibliographies, and position papers. They nagged college presidents and alumni trustees and for the most part failed to make a dent, yet they persisted. And it's this particular quote that resonated with me, immediately recalling Elizabeth Warren's unsuccessful bid to block Jeff Sessions from being confirmed as Attorney General in 2017. To find it written in 1980, 
clues us into why what Mitch McConnell intended to be a censure immediately became a memeable feminist slogan. <laughs> Women's speech, especially in public discourse, has always been a history of persistence, of slow moving advocacy, of bits and pieces that build toward change. The strand of feminist bibliography that I'm tracing is no different. Despite her many, many setbacks, Holden's library helped germinate a generation of women's history scholars, and she ensured its impact would continue by depositing her material at one of the universities that previously refused to teach a women's history class. But Holden did not collect in obscurity. In 1957, she joined a group of women bibliophiles called Ross with the Club. The club was formed in 1944 by New England book collectors, bibliographers, librarians, and book artists, and it survived until its official disbanding in 2004. Many of the initial members had connections with the Grolier Club, which did not admit women until the 1970s. And they wanted a space to celebrate their own collections, share expertise, and in the fashion of upper crust New York, socialize. They named their group after Russ Witha, a 10th century nun whose authorship they found admirable. And they planned to do a few informal gatherings a year, but within the space of a couple years, they had almost 40 members plus additional honorary members who were vocational bibliographers. So my interest in Russ Witha Club um, grows from a question that I began to ask in 2017, which is where are all the women bibliographers? I didn't find them on my preliminary exam list for book history when I was doing my doctoral degree uh, nor most of the readers that I scoured didn't have a lot of articles written by women, much less about them. I uh, spent my doctoral research tracing women's participation in the 18th century print trade, and I learned a very important lesson. Women are always there, sometimes exactly in front of you, like Eleanor James or Mary Catherine Goddard, but more often than not, they're there in ways we're just not prepared to find them. Women may not have been booksellers in substantial numbers in the 18th century, for example, but Maureen Bell has convincingly argued that booksellers, wives and widows, ran shops, kept accounts, hired and fired. They were certainly in the book trades. Tracing the history of women bibliographers has been eerily resonant with that with identifying women in 18th century print. Despite a host of scholarship on book studies and rare books that seems to imagine a genderless and sometimes womanless space, here they were. They were librarians, catalogers, and archivists. They were curators and collectors. Uh, and just like with the book trades, they were wives and widows. Rest with the Club is one nexus within a wider intersection of women's bibliographic labor that has been gerrymandered away from the English and history departments who were taking control of this masculinized and professionalized discourse and kept within social clubs and libraries. As always, there's exceptions to this norm. Elizabeth Eisenstein is the first person that comes to mind. Uh, but by and large, the history of women's bibliographic labor that I will be presenting today happens outside the university. I argue that this club is a notable example of the ways that women who did not have access to the same institutional power in education as men formed an alternative to those institutions. Even with the benefits of race and class, most of these women are white and incredibly wealthy, uh, the Rust Withians history has not been fully explored because of the assumption it was a niche group. Um, ask me later about the drama on the Wikipedia page. Uh, this mirrors a general apathy toward women collectors, perhaps epitomized in the otherwise interesting invention of rare books by David McKittrick, which does not mention women at all. Um, but in sum, Rust with the Club makes visible the great gender disparity of bibliography. That while Greg and Bowers were writing what we see as field defining articles, they were doing so from positions within universities that were not admitting women in any significant numbers, much less employing them as professors. So now on to the club itself. So Russ with the club positioned itself from the beginning as an organization for the brilliant woman bibliophile. In a 1957 interview in the New Yorker, then president Anne Haight offered this description only after a lengthy lecture on the merits of the historical Russ Witha. She always had her priorities. Uh, so she says, the club is an organization of women book collectors, very serious and very excellent ones. We are limited to 40 members plus a few honorary ones. We felt that there should be a club for women bibliophiles and Russ Witha was a great scholar and a great bibliophile. We have members in Philadelphia, Boston, Pittsburgh, Washington, and so on. And we get together four or five times a year. Uh, for lunch and then a short business meeting. Then we're off to be a, a private or public collection. We all send marked catalogs to each other whenever we spot anything another member might fancy. The range of interest is surprising. 
So while they may have intended it as an informal social club on paper, their choices suggest that the club members took very seriously the impact that they expected to have on the rare book world. First of all, they intentionally attracted very notable collectors and scholars. At the first informal meeting at the Cosmopolitan Club in 1944, these eight women were in attendance. Uh, each was an established collector with a special emphasis on botany and herbals for the initial group, but that changed pretty quickly over time. You can also see three vocational bibliographers who I marked with asterisks. Near the beginning, the club heavily favored what they referred to as amateurs, largely society women whose main focuses were philanthropy and raising families, with book collecting as a significant hobby. In this emphasis, the members positioned themselves as a social club, not a professional organization for working bibliographers or librarians. Yet, perhaps with a nod toward the legitimacy they also sought, the initial members included three highly notable women in vocational bibliography. Ruth Granis was a Grolier librarian and actively published in the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America. Um, so did Belle de Costa Green, who's down here on the left. She was the first director of the Morgan Library and has become incredibly well known lately, partially because um, she has a named award from the Medieval Academy of America a reserved for scholars of color. So she was black and passed as Portuguese for most of her life in order to avoid social stigmas. And then we have um, Henrietta Bartlett, who is most well known to those of you who study Shakespeare. And uh, Bartlett received an honorary PhD and was one of the most well known women bibliographers of the 20th century. And so truthfully, while writing this talk, I had a really hard time trying to decide which ones to tell you about. Uh, I kept having a series of more, 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 because um, each one of these women is amazing. Um, heights flights around the world, buying examples of women's print history from Latin America and publishing it in the fantastically radical bookmaking on the distaff side has fascinated me for months. I would love to find a copy out of it. If anyone has me, hit me up. Um, but I get pulled away by Rachel Hunt's exquisite book bindings and the library of botanicals that she felt so strongly about. She donated $3 million to Carnegie Mellon to give it a permanent home. So her name is on that library. And this is before we get into the explicitly feminist projects from people like Miriam Holden and Marjorie Barlow. So when we stop to consider that there are more than 100 women in this club over 60 years, the impact of their collecting is almost hard for me to calculate. And that's why I can't tell you the full scope of this project yet. There's also a couple other wrinkles in figuring out everything about these women. Um, so as membership grew, librarians, catalogers, and vocational bibliographers remained a significant portion of the group. Uh, but club records also have detailed meanings, detailed minutes from every meeting for 50 years. And this is something that I think only comes from when you get a group of bibliographers together. They're very exacting. <laughs> um, so I have seen three complete sets. This is uh, one of the notebooks that I think belonged to Julia Whiteman, who was secretary for a long time. And so all the meeting minutes are standardized and you get them in this exact same size. And so not only did multiple people keep every single copy of the minutes, they got minutes from the meetings before they joined and then would handwrite annotations to them. So actively being involved in this archival practice was part of membership in the club. So this is what a set of meeting minutes uh, looks like. And I'll kind of walk you through this. Uh, we always have the number and the date and the location. So they, they number all their minutes and they celebrate the milestones like the 100th meeting was a very big deal. So they're very um, aware of how often they're meeting and what they're doing. Secondly, we have an update on club members' lives and achievements. This one has um, three things that tended to be pretty typical. One, Henrietta Bartlett gets an honorary PhD. Uh, sometimes this space is taken up by the collaborative works that they're doing together, uh, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And then we have people donating to the Russ with the Club Library. That library is now at the Grolier Club Archive. And they were uh, collecting together as a group for about 50 years actively as a club. And then lastly, whenever one of the members dies, there's an obituary. This one is pretty short for Ruth Granis, but as time went on, these got longer. And this is some of the only obituaries that exist of these women because they weren't widely known. So they didn't get uh, New York Times obituaries very often, but you have them in the club minutes. So then at the top right, you have kind of the meat of this, which is the meeting details. Catherine Bull was a secretary in this example, and she was kind of scant. Julia Whiteman would sometimes write up to six to eight pages telling you exactly what happened in this minute. Um, so I think Catherine Bull was a little bit more doable, but Julia Whiteman was really committed to the idea that even if you weren't there, you were gonna learn something. And then lastly, they always have tea and lunch. 
So even when they get together, they talk about the food, they talked about what they had. Um, and this is where we get into my actual favorite example, which is from February 9th, 1950. And this is from uh, Alice Brayton hosts this meeting. And she is best known as the owner of Green Animals, which is a topiary garden in Rhode Island. She also uh, worked on Rhode Island history. So this is how Alice Brayton throws a party. Beautiful white lilacs were flown in from Holland. <laughs> I am very middle class, so this is a very, a very foreign world to me. Uh, champagne bottles were placed on the table as a sign of frivolity, and little dolls represented the members, each holding a miniature book in which their names were inscribed. A bust of Abraham Lincoln stood appropriately in front of Mrs. Frank Sprague, and the chef had a magnificent cake marked Roswitha and surrounded by pink roses. A record of Brush Up Your Shakespeare from the musical comedy Kiss Me Kate was played as a suggestion for a theme song. And Miss Brayton had prepared a clever questionnaire on Walt Whitman to which, to which Mrs. Sprague, of course, knew all the answers. So I give this to you partially because I find it pure joy, uh, but also because this is exactly the tone that you get from these Rock Vista Club's meetings. They threw a really good party, and then you had to show off how smart you were. It was kind of like a salon. And so, uh, by the way, uh, Harriet Chapman Sprague, who went by Mrs. Frank Sprague, there's three Mrs. Sprague's, all with multiple names, who pop up through the years. Uh, she was an expert on Walt Whitman. This is the catalog for the exhibit that happened at the Library of Congress in 1939. And as you can see here, she actually publishes it as Mrs. Frank Julian Sprague. And so this is the challenge of working on these women, is they were very committed to their formal names, meaning I don't know about 40 of their first names yet because the only way I find them is when we have articles on the husbands, and some of the husbands were boring. <laughs> and so if you don't merit a New York Times article or an obituary, then I don't accidentally find the women's names. So there's some of these that I still don't know who they are, and I'm very much hoping to figure that out. And part of the way I've been finding is just by asking living book collectors, because they were all friends. So I'm trying desperately to ask everybody before this generation uh, leaves us because they uh, the ones that I can't find are the ones from the 50s and 60s and so people who remember them are going to get smaller and smaller every year so I'm on a time clock but hopefully I'll find them all. Uh, so in addition then to their regular meetings and minutes, Ross with the Club is also involved in bibliographic projects particularly about the historical Ross with the. These took shape in several publications in a library. So these are the three. Um, a, bibli a biography of Ross with the here on the left by Robert Herndon Fife in 1947, and then they did a longer biography with a full bibliographical checklist in 1965. And then this one on the right is kind of out of theme, but it is Notes on Women Printers in Colonial America and the United States, and this was in 1976. So I identify these as major because the club put out several smaller pamphlets of members' lectures quite frequently. Uh, several of them are here within the UCLA library. If you type in Ross Witha, you can find them. Uh, usually one of the members would self-fund these pamphlets as a gift or a kind of coterie publication, but these were the ones that took up a good deal of the club meetings minutes and things that they were actively working on. So this first one is the one I'll spend the least amount of time on. Uh, this was done by Robert Fife, who was the husband of Sarah Fife, and she was Russ with the club's first president and is often cited as the person who wanted to start this club. Um, she died pretty quickly into uh, the club's life and they named the library after her so she's not as big of a figure in the minutes but she is remembered very fondly. So this pamphlet was written by Robert Fife because he was a history of German scholar or German history and culture scholar and it's about 40 pages. You can see that they use the Durr woodcut here which is supposed to be Russ Witha and then uh, an image that became their letterhead for years after. Then shortly after, or 20 years later, oh yes, they also decided that they wanted to tell you how to pronounce her name, which I found vastly useful as a person who's not very good at German. Uh, but I love that this was a part of the pamphlet. It's like, you must say her name correctly if you're going to love her as much as we do. Um, so this is the next one, and this one is a pretty big deal for the club. So this was 20 years later, and it represents a decade of work for more than a dozen of these club members. This 1965 book built on the first pamphlet and was much longer and it was hardbound and printed for about 20 or 1200 copies. Russ with the of Gandersheim Lifetimes and Works was referred to affectionately as the checklist in meeting minutes and so I'll refer to it as that as well. Um, they used bibliographical publishers and instead of tapping a useful spouse, this was them actually doing their own bibliographic work for the first time in a collaborative group. As this table of content shows, you can see the names under each title. All of those are us with the club members. This was truly a collaboration across the group. Anne Haight, the editor, 
um, checked and double checked with German language experts and Rastwitha experts, which makes a convincing argument that the club sought its own form of international peer review. Jane Quimby, who was a vocational bibliographer, did much of the meticulous labor of collation, um, attempted to render the book for maximum usefulness to research students, uh, which emphasizes that part of the club's intent was to increase scholarly interest in Raswitha. That is, by building a library on Raswitha works and writing through a thorough bibliography in English, they intended to have more students and collectors in the United States take seriously the contributions of this woman writer. Similarly, the club, minute, the club minutes demonstrate members' earnest desire that this text showcased their own abilities. Meta Harson and Quimby were elected by the club to this task because of their expertise as professional bibliographers. Harson worked at the Morgan, and Quimby had cataloged several major libraries, including Rachel Hunt's botanicals. Barlow wrote to every major library in North America and Europe, and Hunt commissioned research in Germany. Barlow visited several manuscripts in England in person at the British Library and the Bodleian Library in 1958. And they also took it on upon themselves to answer the question of Ruswitha's authorship. So this had been called in, into question in the 40s and they almost didn't name the club after her because it wasn't as sure that she actually wrote the plays um, that we had now attribute to Ruswitha. So the club says, quote, this started a long enduring controversy which could have been solved if anyone had made a paleographical examination of the known manuscripts. It remained for us with the club to do so. So I like the slightly censuring tone here. Like if any of you had cared enough about this to look. <laughs> so yeah, Harson examines the manuscripts. And again, Harson's a um, curator at the Morgan, so she knows her stuff. And she conclusively established their authority once and for all. <laughs> That's how bibliography works, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the group was really adamant then that scans of these manuscripts or plates actually take place in this book. So you can see all the different things that they compared to make sure that you can then check, uh, check their work as well. So I want to point out that this is 20 years after the club first settled on Raswitha as a namesake, and most of those original members have actually died. But something about Raswitha resonated with these bibliophiles. So I believe it was a desire to contribute to the bibliographic legacy of women's engagement with literary history. As collectors who were related to or worked with most of the rare book world in England, these women were well aware of what was considered scholarly and authoritative. They wanted to participate in these discourses publicly rather than privately, despite the club's initial design, while promoting the work of a woman writer who they had taken on as a namesake. So I think that this desire is what uh, propelled their last project. And this is a massive undertaking in identifying every woman printer from colonial America to the present in 1976. This project was largely the work of Marjorie Barlow, although similarly to the checklist, the club was very invested in its production for several years and financed its publication. To compile the list, Barlow sent queries to every institution she could think of in every state. Her notes exist in these red clam uh, clamshell boxes on the right with a pencil for a scale, which doesn't help because you don't know how big the pencil is, but we're all going to imagine because I wasn't being very thorough when I was in the archive. It's in New York, so sorry. Um, they're pretty big. Um, as you might imagine then, California and New York have very thick files. There's a ton of printers in California in the 20th century, whereas Hawaii and Kentucky were quite slim, either because she couldn't find them or they just didn't answer her. Barlow's queries in this book project should be an entire talk its own, so heroically I'm only going to tell you about two letters. Um, I think that this is one of the most understudied archives on women's print history in the 60s and 70s because everybody writing back to her was thinking through their own identities as women printers. When she got in return as highly representative of the messy world of letterpress, they didn't know if they counted as a printer, they didn't know if what they were printing was really books, and so they would just send her copies of things saying, I don't know, what do you think? And so this is one example, and this is Teresa Terry, who was in Denver, and she reported that she only employs women printers. So she said, we do employ only women printers, though we have at various times found it necessary to employ male printers, because so few women have attempted to enter this field. We are finding now that more and more women are getting into the printing field, much to our delight. Women are more apt and able at printing than most males. One of the reasons for this is that women are, as a rule, absolute perfectionists, except when they're taking pictures in archives. <laughs> they pay attention to detail, which is extremely necessary in order to turn out good quality work. They take a great deal of pride in their work and oftentimes actually surprise themselves. It seems to me that our gals have not been given the chance to show what they really can do in this particular vein. And once given that chance, as we do here, they display an amazing amount of ability. 
So several more responses are in this with, within the same vein, discussing the rise of indie printing in San Francisco and their pride in pursuing a trade that was traditionally deemed too masculine. And this is my personal favorite is Sheila Maybanks, and she is a student at the University of Kentucky Press. And she writes, I like myself best with a smock on and printer's ink on my hands. It's a great thing. Barefoot too, I can exert more pressure and more swing. <laughs> I find this wonderful for a lot of reasons, but the, it completely flips the idea of barefoot and pregnant to me. It's like, nah, barefoot and printing. That's the new way. Uh, so Notes on Women Printers was like any directory, immediately out of date as soon as it was printed. And this club also struggled to recoup its costs despite receiving numerous letters of support and admiration from universities and organizations like the American Antiquarian Society. Feminist bibliography has never been a particularly lucrative venture. But Barlow's book sits as an important moment in the club as it began to transition to a, new idea, to a new identity in the 1970s and to think more openly about how it saw its history intersecting with gender in the rare book world. These publications, especially the latter two, are what I identify as feminist bibliography. Whether or not Russ with the club would have understood their work as feminist is actually a lot more complicated. The word feminist never occurs in the records I have found. Some members focus specifically on women's literary history, especially Holden Haight and Barlow, in ways that I think read as feminist, but most did not. Their interests were wide ranging and often their collections aligned with the dominant power structures. As a club, they tended more toward the conservative and radical end of the spectrum when it came to social issues, while simultaneously challenging the idea that women could not seriously collect books. It seems to uphold a separate but equal status with Grolier Club, and they seem to live in harmony with them for many years. But while this was the club's party line, for lack of a better phrase, uh, official meeting minutes also glancingly record these fissures and cracks that reveal what I think was a long simmering belief for many members that their exclusion from Grolier based on gender was unfair and damaging. By the 1970s, there was also a different shift in membership. We're getting more vocational bibliographers, so their interests are naturally different than the socialites who saw themselves very distinctly as amateurs. And this is where we finally get to see a little bit of this in 1974. The meeting minutes record that the club took up the question of girl you're refusing to admit women. A woman named Elizabeth Swain, who as far as I can tell, doesn't have a direct connection to Russ with the club, but I'm still trying to figure uh, out exactly who she was. And she writes to Anne Haight, who was then the president, and she asserts that the Grolier Club is no longer strictly a men's social club, but a professional organization whose interests and activities are germane to women as they are to men. Uh, she expressed hope that the Russ with the club would endorse this viewpoint and give support to her efforts and persuade the Grolier Club board to expunge all extra restrictions against women. The club's response to this was mixed. Haight declines to side with Swain's position and wrote back that, quote, she was not the slightest bit interested in joining the Grolier Club, that we are an ancient and honorable organization with our own ties and have no desire to interfere with the Grolier Club. Haight's response seems to uphold this separate but equal status. Ruswithians are frequently referred to as the feminine Grolier by both themselves and other people. Uh, but for Haight and many others, this divide did them no identifiable harm. But for others, it did. Mary Hyde Eccles was a member of both clubs and collector of Johnson and Wilde. You probably best know her for the Hyde collection of Johnson at the Houghton. And she reported in her memoirs that a friend of hers swore to get married solely so she could use him to access Grolier events. <laughs> Love it. Um, but some Ruswithians also felt, similarly to this friend, that they were disadvantaged. And one of them was Phyllis Goodhart Gordon, who was a Renaissance scholar. And she argued that exclusion from Grolier events damaged her professionally. So she noted that it was a great disadvantage to her when she exhibited her father's collections of bindings there and was not there, bleh, bindings there, and was not allowed to be present at the meeting when those bindings were the subject of an exhibit. She too felt that the Grolier Club is now a professional rather than a social club, and there is a cause for reconsideration of its position. I find this just amazingly hard to, to put my, my hands around. The idea that it's your bindings and you give them to them for an exhibit and then you don't even get to attend to hear the lecture. Um, so she did not like that, and she became one of the first women that was admitted to Grolier just two years later when they finally did open their doors. The meeting minutes don't record much else of this debate, unfortunately. Uh, Gordon's arguments note a schism in professional versus social, perhaps vocational versus avocational, that both clubs were undergoing. Are we a social club or are we a professional organization? As Ross Witha admitted more feminine or vocational bibliographers, scholars, and librarians, 
their professional interests diverged with maintaining the social status quo. Uh, status quo. This isn't to say that hate unquestionably upheld the gender divide that disadvantaged women. She advocated for women's agency within the rare book world, and her response emphasizes that she believed Ruswitha had done equally as much as Grolier toward proving its legitimacy. That is, Ruswitha didn't need Grolier to validate its existence. Women book collectors, especially very serious and very excellent ones, could exist on their own merits and through their own practices and histories. So Ross with the club did eventually decline, uh, especially after the 1990s. Grolier admitting women in the 1970s is often cited as the reason why. I strongly disagree with that, but my talk is over, so I will answer questions about it later. Uh, but the work of its members at its peak shows this is an important vehicle for community-driven feminist bibliography. Most of what we have of Ross with the club is because of the members' own desire to preserve their work and that of their colleagues. The reason that I have that Miriam Holden quote that I opened with is because of Rachel Hunt. She insisted on self-funding a pamphlet of Holden's talk after she gave it, and Holden kept the card that Hunt wrote to her, and Hunt said, thank you so much for the delightful afternoon. Not only that, but your very scholarly and erudite paper on women touched my heart. I really meant what I said, that I thought your article should be, should be published as, as perhaps a keepsake. You're wonderful to do this for us with the club. I think it is one of our high spots and nobody appreciated your work more than I did. This keepsake is of course a piece of women's bibliographic history, a record of women's agency and ability to educate themselves even when social norms dissuaded them from seeking education formally. Through community and collecting, they built something remarkable. And I hope that what I have shown today is that here under the guise of a simple social club for women wrapped in the rhetoric of feminized deference that is all throughout these minutes, we have one of the most remarkable examples of feminist bibliography in the United States. So thank you for sharing your stories with me. All right, so we've got time for Q&A, about 10 minutes. So you, know, you can also go get some food, but anyone have any questions? Kelly. Will you share the Wikipedia drama? <laughs> yes. Uh, so I learned about Ross Butha because last year I was doing a 31 days of women's book history Twitter campaign because I hate myself and I wanted to write 31 profiles in 31 days apparently. And somebody suggested this club and I thought, okay, that sounds like fun. So I go on the Wikipedia page about a week before it was supposed to post and there's just this flag notice that says deleted because it's not important enough. And so I went to the discussion page and I was like, what? And so I read it and this guy had done, I don't know if it's a guy, but I do but had done this bad research, <laughs> terrible research, and decided that this wasn't notable enough to warrant a Wikipedia page. And so then I just looked at it and I was filled with feminist rage. And so then I decided that I had to write a book on this and prove this guy on, Wik on Wikipedia wrong. So hi, I'm here to make a very petty, petty, angry thing correct with an entire book that will take up six years of my life. I'm very comfortable with this. But the librarians mobilized, and so several people who work at the Folger in particular went on and beefed up the page, added more citations, and eventually it, they decided to keep it. But you can go look at the discussion page if you want to see it. Still there, still angry. So I have a question from the control room. Um, some of our colleagues at the Clark Library have asked if the two volume list from 1965 is published. Uh, the 1965 was a single volume and it was published. Um, there's 1,200 copies. I think the Clark has one. Uh, they might not. I know the Huntington has one and there is one here at UCLA Special Collections. And so there's one in the UC system for sure. Yeah. And I found one on um, Abe Books for 20 bucks. So. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, what is the legacy of their work right now in more general, like, history of the book bibliography mm -hmm. circles? So you've done this deep dive to re-excavate it. Was, was there, is there some sort of field that was appreciating the work of the Hrostwitha Club and their bibliography, or was it something that we've seemed to have collectively forgotten? 
Uh, I have found almost nothing written on this club at all. The only person that I know of who's taken an interest in them is Elizabeth Denlinger, who's at the New York Public Library, and she's a romanticist. Um, so she sent me a conference paper that she did at Chawton, and then the Girder Lerner piece was an obituary for Holden, and that's more or less it, is these obituaries and then these tiny um, library history pieces will pop up every now and then. So in my war larger work on women bibliographers, basically every librarian Every library has a woman who was really good at something at one point and she appears in one article and then we never see her again. And so at the Clark, it was Cora Edgerton Sanders, I believe, who was in charge for a very few years. And when you're in charge of a library, like we talked about Dorothy Porter several times, you shape that library, you shape its collections, you shape the way that it talks about itself, you shape the kind of programs that you want to build. And so women have been shaping rare book history for years in ways that we haven't connected. So I find it in library history, but library history isn't as interested in the questions that I'm trying to ask as a book historian. So within book history and bibliography circles, I'm sure individually some of them have been important. Uh, Belle da Costa Green has a full biography. That's incredibly rare. Uh, there's almost nothing written on Russ with the club. And there's this also kind of irony to it with the sense that most of them were not allowed in Grolier for most of their lives, but now Grolier is the one in charge of their archive. And this is an irony that I have found repeated over and over again with women's histories. Um, so I'm very grateful actually that Grolier took the archive because the, there's a much worse scenario in which nobody took it and we don't have access to it, but that does feel like a bit of an irony to that. Yeah. If you do listening out there have another article for me, please send it. Okay. Yes. Portuguese. What more do you know about her? What was her name? Belle da Costa Green. She is the uh, director of the Morgan Library, and there is a biography on her called An Illuminated Life, I believe, by Heidi Aridizone. I'm going to get that name wrong. Um, I can spell it for you later. And she um, had a black father, but added the da Costa to her name to sound more Portuguese. And she was the librarian for JP Morgan and then convinced him to turn his library into a public institution, which it now is. Um, and so she was remarkable in a lot of ways. I got to look at some of her letters and she knew her stuff and was particularly interested in incunables, early printed books and manuscripts, which is why the Medieval Academy of, of America has kind of um, acknowledged her as an early medievalist, even though I don't think she talked about herself that way. Uh, but I went to the Morgan and they love Bell Green. They will effuse to you about Bell Green. They will, they stand their, their director. They love her history and her work. And so I would definitely just take a look. I think I'd love to talk to you if you want to know more. And I think we have time for one more question. Is anything? Great. Let's give Kate another round of applause. Thank you so much. So we've got plenty of food. So while we set up, you know, feel free to grab, take, we'll take a beat because uh, I think, do you want to open your seat? Okay, cool. Um, so I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing our last speaker, who the last time I saw give a talk actually made me cry. Uh, and so I hope that doesn't happen again. Um, uh, Tia Blassengame is a book artist and printmaker exploring the intersection of race, history, and perception. Utilizing printmaking and book arts techniques, she renders racially charged images and histories for a nuanced discussion on issues of race and racism. Uh, Blassengame holds a BA in architecture from Princeton, an MA in book arts uh, from Corcoran College of Art and Design, and an MFA in printmaking from uh, RISD. Uh, Blassengame is an assistant professor at of art at Scripps College, where she teaches book arts and serves as the director of Scripps College Press. So please give a big round of applause to Tia. Great, thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank um, Devin, everyone involved in um, organizing this panel, my co-panelists, everyone here, everyone here virtually. <clears throat> um, 
Um, and I have to say that my um, interests around um, feminist bibliography um, are really centered around the portrayal and involvement of African American women, black women, women of color um, in the book arts field, um, book print history, the future of the book, um, uh, but particularly the book as artwork. Um, and I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna go back and take that one. Um, so I'm gonna present um, about six of my own artist book projects. Um, and part of why I take this space and time to do that um, is um, in many ways um, taking this moment to um, explain my own practice, my own work, so it's not mischaracterized, um, aspects of it are not um, missed. Um, and then I'm hoping time will allow and some of my work I'll kind of pass through very quickly um, because I wanna make time um, to talk about some student work coming out of Scripps College Press imprint. Um, and then when we finish up, I'll kind of set up, I brought um, a few of my own pieces, but um, a lot of student work. Um, as um, folks know, if you have um, some involvement or interaction with artist books, um, the whole point is for you to handle the work. Um, so I'm hoping to give um, people that are here an opportunity to do that. Um, but I want to start with um, Coast to Coast, a Women of Color National Artist Book Project. Um, and I want to sort of start my um, talk there um, just as kind of inspiration for myself. Um, I would say that I think about this project a lot. Um, so it's a traveling exhibition, um, 1987, um, originally conceived of by Faith Bringold. Um, and features artist books um, by women of color to the tune of about 200 women of color. Um, and I think about this um, project a lot, um, and sometimes with a little indignation and anger, I'm thinking about um, my own education in book arts and how this um, project was never discussed. Um, and I think even um, in looking at the history of um, artist books, of the book arts field, it's not really discussed, um, which is kind of shocking and still disappointing. Um, and so just thinking about my own work in relationship to um, these hundreds of uh, women of color um, involved in um, book arts and sort of writing themselves into history, but in many ways being erased from that history. Um, and showing a few pieces on the left, um, an artist book by Bissa Washington, in the event anyone, um, uh, anyone disappears. Um, on the right, a piece by Faith Ringgold and Lisa Yi, My Best Friend. Um, also Clarissa Sly's What's Happening to Mama, just to show three artist books out of 200. Um, some in the case of the work by Clarissa Sly, um, many might be very familiar with, um, but to think of that loss of these 200 works um, by women of color within uh, book arts um, that we don't know, we can't sort of come, you know, conjure um, images of because they're just not really discussed. Um, so I just kind of want to acknowledge that and kind of start from that. Um, from here, I'd like to sort of um, move through um, some of my own work. Um, and I'll just say very briefly, um, with my own work um, with artist books, I'm always trying to engage the viewer reader um, in a conversation typically related to historical contemporary racism um, through materiality to kind of seduce the reader, um, you know, decisions related to color, tactility, pacing. Um, also um, using archival documents, um, archival research, um, and sort of accepting that looks um, sort of all over the place. Archival might be, you know, related to um, newspaper and, and television as well, um, and typically bringing my own writing in. So I'll sort of um, give that as some background and then kind of get into some, some projects. 
and try to keep on time as well. Um, so the first piece I want to talk about is hers, um, a primer of sorts. And so this is a piece um, that was created 2013 as part of a larger um, artist book project, um, inventory of for Almutanabi Street, um, sort of um, commemorating and building out of um, a car bombing um, to a book selling street. Um, with this project, my interest was more um, upon those sort of countless um, women around the world who may lack um, uh, access to education, scholarship, whether it's restricted or forbidden. Um, but despite that sort of lack of opportunity, you know, in relationship to threats of violence, intimidation, um, that these female readers still kind of gain strength and knowledge from books. Um, in this case, um, the covers are coming from um, just Guarded almanac pages. Um, this was a piece that I think for me is very significant in that, um, you know, I had signed on to this project. Um, and then once I um, got to the point of actually act actualizing this project, I was flat broke, um, which was pretty distressing to me. Um, originally conceiving of this as, you know, letterpress printed, um, you know, beautiful um, printmaking papers, um, you know, which I couldn't afford at all. Um, and I think for me, it's kind of a turning point in that um, with that sort of pressure of being too broke to afford kind of anything, um, I had to use what was available to me, which was um, basically a, a pad of um, washi paper that I happen to have on hand and my really crappy copier. Um, and I think it ended up um, actually ending up being a pretty strong project. Um, so this is a piece that again is digitally printed um, on the um, outside of each page. Um, there are letter forms, there are fabric that again are digitally printed. Um, and that text that you're seeing is the result of um, being backlit of some um, sort of light coming through and shining through that text is printed. Um, in reverse on the back side. Um, and there is a piece of it kind of open. You can sort of see because it's uh, been pulled out um, from the covers, um, this sort of flutter book, um, that some light is getting in to sort of um, illuminate that text, which I'll um, read really briefly. Hiding a book under cover, under cloth, this text sacred saves my life. Verse upon verse recited, inhaled, for when it is found and taken away one day, eventual, too late, maybe, I will know each word to speak it often, low in day or dark, under this fabric skin. Um, and I'm just gonna keep moving on. So I wanna kind of move um, very quickly through um, the various kind of, um, iterations of one project harvest. Um, and it's really to get to a, a sort of um, final and sort of current state of that project. So bear with me, you're gonna see a lot of things quickly. So I wanna start with um, the first iteration of this project, Harvest as Prints. Um, in this case, um, this project was my way of kind of getting to know um, Rhode Island, Providence specifically. Um, every day, several times a day, I was following um, One Street Benefit Street, um, where you have Brown University um, and Rhode Island School of Design campuses kind of intersecting. Um, I was sort of performing this performative act of collecting leaves um, while I was doing research at the John Carter Brown um, tied to the slave trade in that town or emanating from that town, kind of thinking of um, the few slaves that would have been there. Um, so first starting with sets of um, screen prints, in this case the yellow are leaves, which you can see a little bit closer here, um, screen printed over and over and over again. Um, so they built up kind of um, a thickness and then coming back in um, with wax, um, pigment, um, paint as well. 
Um, and this is, um, you know, I did several um, of these series and it wasn't really doing anything exciting. There was no kind of interaction um, that I was having uh, with the reader. Um, and then finally moving that to um, a book at the same time of doing that research, kind of having this moment of being able to handle these slips of paper um, from the 1700s related to, um, in this case, the Brown family's um, interaction with the slave trade um, and having this sort of um, overwhelming moment of coming across tiny slip of paper um, that's really um, the transaction of the selling of a human being. And I think that's when that information and experience um, of collecting material, um, of making these prints came together in a way that was satisfying for me in a book form. And I'll just kind of keep going. Um, so becoming harvest, holding and trading. So this um, covers um, matching my skin tone, this sort of cacophony of colors of the leaves, um, sort of encompassing that moment, overpowering moment for me, this tiny slip of paper. And I'm just gonna kind of keep going. Um, and so out of that sort of came, um, out of the research came information um, that I sort of in the back of my head had, had but I didn't really have um, proof, at least for this project. Um, but sort of going through um, different receipts, different accountings, um, coming across in this next piece is um, a different version. Um, so um, this accounting of the involvement of women. Um, so in this case, um, someone's slaves have been um, lent out. Um, someone is paying for um, that labor um, and the person who takes the money. Um, so the person who um, answers the door at that point to take the money um, is someone's wife. Um, and thinking about that, um, that tie also for women um, in relationship to um, whether it's when their husband dies um, and they might um, acquire the slaves as well. This is something um, during this project that I was sort of looking for, um, but not necessarily as a focus. And I'm going to keep kind of going um, in relationship to this project. Um, and still, you know, I had the book that was satisfying, but not necessarily um, the end, I thought, for the project, um, and then starting to sort of move back into um, the visual information that I had created. Um, so those early prints, um, coupled with um, the pages of the book, trying to look for a way um, to bring those together. Um, and so actually moving digitally. Um, to start to combine them, um, and then moving that onto fabric. So that page becoming something that can be worn. Um, and then moving to um, Harvest and actually Slavery's historic house signs, scarves. Um, so these were pieces that again, sort of tying into um, the prints, um, research that I was doing as well um, around the Brown family. Um, and the sort of historic um, families in town as well, their involvement with the slave trade. Um, I had a chance to have um, several students, administrators, faculty um, at Brown and RISD um, wear these um, and sort of see what that experience was and sort of uh, give that information back to me. Um, and th that was very interesting, but actually not the most interesting aspect for um, this um, iteration of the project is actually um, having uh, private collectors acquire um, some of the scarf pieces and sort of come back to me and explain um, that for them, they saw these pieces as, even though they were telling um, histories of specific families in uh, Rhode Island, um, that they felt that they were um, really kind of a stand-in for their family's lost history. Um, so in many cases, they were seen as um, heirlooms that were going to be handed down to the next generation of their family. Um, and those um, women knew that that was going to be, be the case when um, their mother passed away. This was gonna be um, one of the things that they would um, be inheriting. Um, and, you know, recognizing that it's not speaking um, explicitly about their family, but again, it was a stand-in for that. 
Um, and that was very surprising to me and kind of still is, um, but it sort of gives me a different um, sense, particularly around this work. Um, this is uh, me many years ago um, wearing these pieces and there's are some of the other pieces. So they're combining a cyanotype on um, silk in this case, um, cotton um, mixed with African um, wax fabric and that's sort of um, choice sort of tied to um, a trip to South Africa, also velvet as well. And so many of these are um, either in private collections or um, at public institutions. So I'm interested to see what happens in the next 10 to 20 years of uh, when that next generation of women and families um, acquire, acquires um, those pieces and kind of what they, they do with them. And there's a piece uh, at a show at a Ringling College. And there's another with no text. Um, so from there, um, I wanna talk kind of briefly about uh, Negro's A Handbook, which is turning into um, a multi-set kind of series. I've sort of come back to um, the ideas around this project recently and um, very quickly built it out into another three books. So I'm excited um, to be finishing those later this year. Um, in this case, thinking about uh, what a book would look like if it could be a handbook to you. Um, so in this case, this is a handbook to me at a certain period in time. Um, and really sort of tying to a kind of patterning, thinking about um, the beach, um, and in this case, actually, I'm tied to summers at Martha's Vineyard. Um, but particularly thinking about in that in terms of not explaining that. If you are fine with that, that's great. If you're not and you don't understand how um, a handbook to an African-American woman could be tied to that, um, you just need to to read these pieces. Um, so it's all uh, my own writing as well. Let me sort of take you through that. And so I think around this time, kind of 2015, um, you know, as I speak to you um, about these projects, um, for me, I had a point of just accepting the decisions that I'm making um, and how I'm trying to connect with individual readers. Um, whether you question that or not, um, I feel that if you actually physically engage with the piece, the piece um, sort of justifies itself and takes away those questions from you. Um, I want to move on to a smaller piece, uh, Yvette's Purse. Um, and this ties directly to an incident um, in 2015, um, actually February 3rd. Uh, when a 38-year-old mother of two, Yvette Henderson, uh, was shot and killed by Emery, Emeryville um, California police officers near um, extra space storage at the border of Oakland um, and Emeryville. Um, and so with this piece, it started with um, my own uh, writing around that. Um, and then really wanting to come back to that as a concrete poem um, to sort of um, hone in on my sort of um, ideas around that. Um, so the concrete poem is um, of her purse um, on the ground, kind of in the aftermath um, of her killing. It tries to sort of summarize the events of and after her death. Um, and sort of um, those two sort of conflicting stories of what is true. Um, so shoplifting, I am fleeing surrounded by police officers with AK-15 assault rifles and body cameras off, surrounded, shot, shot, shot. Fragments of me litter the pavement. Firemen hose down the site, no spot, of, no spot on your daily commute like I never happened. But people gather stolen Home Depot flowers and build memorials, marching. People lock arms. They demand justice for Yvette Henderson and transparency. So I'm gonna kind of keep going because I wanna make sure I have time to show some student work as well. Um, so this is another project that sort of has various iterations. 
um, so guilty. And I'm just gonna take you through a little bit of process. Um, so kind of inking up, and again, this is um, having an idea, just kind of playing around with it. Um, this is sort of inking up again um, on the press. Um, working with pressure prints, so um, you can think of it as a very low relief. Um, in this case, using sticker paper um, to create a tonal image. Um, on the left, kind of have the aftermath or sort of creepy aftermath of um, what I've pulled on the press bed. On the right, you have um, that gray final image. Um, on the middle ground, um, that red, white, and blue. Um, and actually at the top, guilty, um, is one of my matrices. Um, so instead of using um, letterpress, uh, wood or metal type, in this case, I'm using vinyl letters. And starting to kind of play around. For me, I have to be like purposefully um, messy with my work or gritty with my work. Um, it's not stylistically something that I would prefer. So different iterations, especially kind of gritty. Um, and then that version that I would prefer. Um, and so this was really looking at, um, you know, who is considered to be guilty, right? Um, and to me, sort of ridiculously so. Um, that you would have to say not guilty, obviously not guilty. Um, and then for me, um, with this project, I was looking at um, victims of police brutality, but feeling very uncomfortable with um, presenting their images. Um, obviously, someone's loved one. Um, I just wasn't comfortable with that. Um, and so to me, the only um, option was to have myself as a stand-in, um, but I was not really comfortable with that. Um, and it took me almost a year to find a way to be comfortable with that. Um, and it became these um, images uh, of myself kind of across my lifetime with severe changes. For you as the reader, you may not um, notice these changes or sort of lies that are in um, the images, but I do, and it's enough for me to feel comfortable um, that I'm presenting uh, myself to you. And so out of that becomes um, I am. And so again, I'm sort of a stand in um, for victims of police brutality. So what does it mean to consider even the baby? is guilty, right? Um, and this is at a, sh a show at um, Santa Barbara Community College. Um, taking you again through process, um, so you can sort of see um, image um, that's still on the press bed. Um, in the drawing rack, these three um, figures, that's actually my, um, those are my print matrices. Let's see, sort of um, the matrix here and here. So I'm uh, using, using photographs, which I'm altering again to remove information, change information. So I feel comfortable kind of giving you my whole life um, to express this. And there's a finished print. And I'm gonna keep going down to my mixing of colors representing all these different time periods. And that is kind of like the sum total of my life at that point um, in the different sections. And then starting to kind of come back through with uh, text that I'm gonna um, connect with that. So these assumptions that are made, um, so particularly, um, you know, I think a lot of times we focus in on um, black men and boys um, and don't really recognize um, the experiences of black women and girls. Um, so what is it for the toddler to be considered menacing? For the child that you would have to say probably guilty? Um, in this case, thinking about uh, Mike Brown um, and that moment of should be a very exciting day as the graduate um, but you're considered suspicious. Um, and then for those who are not 
uh, familiar with letterpress printing. Um, so this is um, the typeface uh, or portion of the typeface for um, the introduction of this book. And then me agonizing over um, typos, um, different characters that need to be removed from that. And then there's it printed. Um, as well as including uh, an image of myself with the caption, um, not credible. What does that mean when the author um, is not a credible source or is not considered a credible source? And then moving to um, the next project, you are kind of maintaining um, that format that I created in I Am, um, but having a slightly different or completely different um, focus. So with this project, I started um, by looking at um, Hallmark romance films, um, where the overwhelming majority of the protagonists are white, um, and then looking at the descriptions, um, particularly the descriptors of, of those protagonists, developing a list from that, um, recognizing that as an African-American woman, most people would not use any of these descriptors to describe me, um, and then trying to take parts of that and create another um, list of descriptors to create kind of a fractured list of affirmations for black women and black girls. So again, using um, myself as a stand-in, um, similar format where the texts really are captions, um, so non-threatening, deserving, not too black, among others. So I want to move into um, some student work, um, and then maybe after some Q&A, we can take a look at, at some of that work. Um, so students that I work with are interested all, about all sorts of things. Um, sometimes it's their position in the world as women, as women of color, um, wondering if it's okay to center themselves in the book. Um, or their sort of experiences within their body and in the world. Um, so one of the first books I wanna talk about is Divisive and Diverse, A Voting Story. Um, so this is a collaborative book um, that we created during um, 2016 presidential campaign. Um, I think we were um, finishing that work across um, the election. Um, and this was obviously a really um, challenging project, challenging time. Um, the students that I was working with, this was the first time that they were voting. Um, and so they were just trying to make sense of all of this and if this was normal and um, trying to find a way to sort of keep going. Um, and in many ways, um, their work on this project kind of kept them going. Um, and so this is um, at its base, uh, sort of timeline um, related to identity and voting. Um, so I think initially this group was looking, um, thinking they were looking at women, really they were looking at um, access to voting for white women. And so sort of breaking that down and recognizing that that was what they were thinking of to really look at um, all types of voters, all types of women and their access. Um, during this process, they also um, generated a survey um, that they sent out um, to friends, family, members of Claremont University Consortium as well, um, tied around to identity, um, voting rights, rights that um, people were concerned about or scared that they were gonna lose. I think they got about 160 responses, which is amazing. Um, and some of those uh, responses factor into um, the book. This play or not. Um, so this kind of takes you through um, the piece. So it's a container um, that has their colophon, um, their sort of letter to the reader. It's a fish bone. Um, it doesn't have a hard cover. Um, inside has those quotes with just minimal um, imagery. Um, so this is sort of up close of um, those sort of milestones around um, voting access 
and then um, you can sort of see in um, centrally um, some imagery um, to the right um, if you look down is also some responses from that survey um, but primarily I want to focus in on some um, individual students efforts um, so this is a feminist introduction to data structures um, which describes about four commonly used data structures in computer science. Um, in many ways, it's an introduction to data structures for feminists, but then it conversely is also um, an introduction potentially to feminism for um, computer scientists. Um, and this is a piece that um, uses wood and metal type as well. It kind of reads almost as a textbook um, but some of the examples are actually pretty hilarious. Um, this piece is loose leaf, um, and this is just kind of fun. This was a student who right from the get-go liked tea, and that's what they wanted to focus in on. Um, that's it. Um, and so it's a huge tea bag. Um, on the label is their colophon. Um, and then inside each page represents a different tea that's stained around um, the name of the tea is that specific tea um, with a line of cut kind of detail information about um, where it's coming from in the world brewing information as well. Uh, the next piece is changing face saving face. Um, and this is an accordion book. Um, that really is kind of an interplay between um, Changing Face, opera from Sichuan province in China, and then the sociological concept of face in um, Chinese culture. And so when you, um, and I'll kind of keep going. So when you um, remove the different um, lino cut masks, um, text information comes up. So you're kind of involved. You can't necessarily put the mask on, um, but you have that interaction of removing the mask to get more information. Um, efflorescence um, sort of kind of creates its own environment. Um, so this is the student's attempt to kind of recreate their experience in nature. Um, where a hike is kind of interrupted by a storm. Um, in this case, it's a modified double pamphlet um, instant book. Um, and it kind of takes the reader on this sort of recreation of this kind of dramatic um, journey as they sort of flip through um, with these paper cutouts um, that sort of take you through the journey. Um, the front and back cover have clouds that kind of flip up and sort of um, embrace um, and sort of frame um, the whole experience as well. And then I'm going to finish with one last piece. Para sakin, mula sakin, to myself, from myself. Um, and this piece, a, a pamphlet book, um, this was a piece by a student who really wanted to explore um, their experience as a Filipina American. Um, related to kind of not being considered Asian, but not being considered American, and their own sort of um, experience with their own culture and maybe not feeling that it's good enough. Um, and so that first letter talks about um, those feelings and then kind of takes you through um, different aspects of, of her culture that she loves and sort of finishes on this letter of, you know, looking back now and really um, accepting and kind of loving um, who she is and her culture as well. Um, and then I'm going to leave that up to sort of um, for anyone interested in um, some of the projects that I've talked about or haven't talked about, um, giving you links for um, Scripps Press um, and then my own uh, Primrose Press. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A, so any questions? Yep. Thank you so much. That was amazing, and both you and your students do really inspiring work. Um, 
you shared a lot about your personal thought processes mm -hmm. as you working through these. And in one picture I saw that you had headphones in. What do you listen to while you're doing this? Lots of blues, lots of blues. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, can you tell me more about uh, your your students' uh, program and and who's who's doing who's attracted to this work and and yeah just sure. more general <laughs> sure um, so Scripps College is a women's college but we're part of a consortium of schools so um, Pomona Pitzer Harvey Mudd Claremont McKenna um, so not just women are taking these classes um, but I think people who love books. Or some aspect of books um, you know I don't necessarily have lots of like art majors um, which is interesting to have those conversations um, because I think most of us but particularly if you're not an art major um, have um, certain feelings about your ability to create art and imagery um, which is always interesting to have um, so it, it's people coming with all different connections and feelings around books and I find that within the book arts field as well, um, which is very interesting. Recently, the last few years, I, I'll have a sprinkling of students who um, had some sort of a book arts class in high school and I'm always like, ah, that's a thing now, Why, like, I need to be in that class. Um, but, but very few. Um, and, you know, when students are not art majors, um, that doesn't mean that they're not artists, even though they may think they're not. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't make images. It doesn't mean they can't draw, but they probably at some point have been told otherwise. Um, I think to me, I'm always very excited when the class is coming from all different disciplines, um, just because the critiques are stronger, so the feedback is more varied. Um, ways of seeing vary as well, um, and through that, everyone's work gets elevated, whether they initially think that's going to occur or not. Sure. Um, so I would say typically my work um, ends up living, my little roommates end up living um, in special collections libraries, um, which I love because it can be really challenging subject matter. And it's nice to know that there's someone there who can kind of give context and not just have you like sit with something about a lynching and you need to like suffer through or freak out um, that they can sort of position you um, increasingly my work is going into museums um, which is has never been kind of like an interest or reason for doing this um, I'm interested to see how what that looks like um, how they kind of utilize um, the work so I just want it to get out there. Um, I'm very open to, I mean, I love like handset letterpress. That's personal for me. I want to sit and like set every character. And if it's my own writing, I'm trying not to do this, but I like want to edit it while I'm setting it because I'm crazy, but like, that's amazing. Um, but I know that's not for everyone that handling or interaction with like a handbound letterpress printed piece. Um, for a lot of people, that's like all kinds of anxiety wrapped into one bundle. Um, so I'm open to digital or whatever it takes that, you know, as many people as possible have um, access or ownership or can um, kind of continue the relationship with that piece. Um, and so something like uh, printing on fabric and, um, 
you know, I kind of um, moved very quickly through that, but very much when um, Harvest Reimagined occurs, there for me is this shift in the viewer reader, um, where there's the viewer reader who owns the piece, who's um, determining what information is accessible by how they're, um, you know, somehow combining and tying things. Um, and then there's um, the reader who might not be able to read it because the person wearing it won't give them access. And so there are other relationships that they have with, um, with the book and then with this other um, wear reader. Um, so, and to some extent, um, when I had a chance to actually have people try um, that work out and move around the space with that, um, I was mainly interested in having um, black women wear that. Um, and because there's already a way that they are um, surveilled and observed. Um, so just because it's on a black woman, everyone is gonna know it's there, right? Because they're already gonna be um, primed to watch and observe that person. Um, but then what happens when you have something that they don't have, that they've never seen, that they can't quite access? Um, are you going to approach that person? Are you going to be too scared? Are you going to have feelings about why can't I access what that says? Um, and so for me, that was the group that I was most focused in on. And then once people heard I was sort of involved in this project, a lot of different types of people um, approached me to be involved. And we had sort of uncomfortable conversations because initially I didn't want, <laughs> want them to be involved. Um, but I sort of included a range of people to see sort of what, what the experiences would be. So we have a question from our um, Zoom uh, participants. Uh, Catherine D. Harris asks how much you're setting up your students to think about their work or maybe how do you invite them to explore and experiment? So I try to be very clear, um, you know, because I think a lot of times initially when students are um, thinking about a project, approaching me, um, it's very tentative. Um, part of it is they're trying to feel me out to see what I'm okay with. Um, and then as they get to know me, it's pretty much everything. As long as you're willing to um, back up what your decisions are and what you're trying to do, um, and that things are not just arbitrary because you just like it, right? Um, but I try to be very open, um, just thinking about um, aspects of my own um, education where um, the projects that I was doing were, um, I think they made certain professors uncomfortable. Um, and so they sort of didn't shut things down. I don't think that would have been possible in my case, um, but they weren't as supportive as they should have been and what I, what I needed. Um, and so I try to be explicit in um, my interest in what they're trying to do. And I think particularly for students who are um, interested in working um, around identity, um, culture, um, their experience as women in spaces that are not um, open to their being there, um, particularly like around the sciences, um, I want to be very clear that what they are wanting to explore, I am all for it and want to see where that goes. So hopefully that answers the question. Yep, one final question. Thank you for the presentation. That was really moving. Um, I'm wondering about the, <clears throat> the students' works and mm -hmm. kind of what the timeline looks like for the students because you can see that there's a lot of thought that's going into mm -hmm. them in terms of the content, um, but in some cases also multiple printing techniques. So I'm curious kind of how long they're working on these projects. Sure. So I'd say in most cases, students are coming to these classes, they don't really have like letterpress printing um, experience outside of maybe a sprinkling who taken a book arts class in high school, right? Um, and so all of this is new to them, book Binding, letterpress printing. Um, most students will probably from elementary school have some experience with like linoleum block carving. Um, and I'm finding increasingly that's 
they'll even say if that's not what we're going to do, like, how about we do some linoleum block carving? Because um, they are feeling kind of out of their depth and they want to have something they feel like um, will be successful. Um, but so really it's the first half of the semester kind of getting them um, used to typesetting, used to the Vandercooks we have, um, also sort of going through and understanding um, the precision that's required, right? Um, and sort of thinking about and looking at how um, artists present their ideas, um, working on image making. I know for me, my background's in printmaking, so like I want their printmaking, that, those relief prints to be phenomenal, right? Um, I honestly have to say I'm more interested in content um, than the ex execution of like the bindings. Um, hopefully we reach kind of a middle ground, um, but I prefer not to have pieces that are like stunningly well crafted and there's no there there, there's nothing there, right? Um, and I think for most students, they come to these classes because it's gonna give them an opportunity to express themselves. Many, um, the first day of class, pretty much know what they want to do, right? Um, but many don't. Um, and it's kind of through um, smaller projects, um, spending time in special collections, um, looking at artist books, that everyone kind of gets to a point of where they think, at least, um, they want to move forward. But again, many students, um, I've had students the first day of class kind of like corner me because they're like, hi, and they're like vibrating, right? Um, I know what I want to do in this, and they'll, they can take me page by page through, right? Um, and I think every student to some point gets to that moment of just vibrating with excitement, um, with possibility that you have control. You, this is your space to say whatever you want. You can express who you are and your experiences. Um, and I think with letterpress printing, it gives you a way that um, it looks professional. It looks believable. It's the printed word where, you know, we're going to accept to some extent what you're saying, or at least you, you'll have our attention in a way that maybe you've never had before. Um, and then so the last half of the semester is kind of um, almost production. Um, I feel very strongly about students additioning work, um, not just making a unique piece. Um, additioning itself is an art form um, and can be kind of a slog, but once you've gone through it and you know that you can do it, um, then you can continue to do that. Great. Um, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and then if anyone's interested, I have tons of student work and they are lots of fun to um, check out. So I'll pull some stuff out in a minute. Um, so for our online viewers, uh, I'd just like to thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, uh, because of my personal curse, uh, we have are dealing with issues nationally. Uh, but hopefully in a few weeks, we'll have uh, video footage of each of the talks online with closed captions so they'll be fully accessible because I think those of us who made it in the room today will all agree that this was a very exciting set of papers and discussions and it's just a beginning of, or rather a furthering of existing uh, conversations on feminist bibliographies. Uh, so once again, thanks to all of the uh, speakers and thank you to the UCLA Library for allowing us to hold this event. All right, bye bye.